I have about 45 minutes worth of slides that I'm going to condense into about 12 and a half minutes. So we're going to go at light speed. If you would like the slide deck, I will happily email it to you. So, you know, if stuff just goes flying by, it goes flying by. It. You'll get it later. Uh, so that's me. Uh, that's my family. There we go. <laughs> that's a fish I bought at Safeway. There you go. That's me in a nutshell. There we go. <clears throat> so I've been involved directly with three major brands. We were the Pizza Hut franchisee for Southern Alberta, so we had 33 locations, about $35 million in sales south of Edmonton. Uh, I've been an A&W franchisee since I was 19. I used to work for A&W. Uh, they decided to refranchise all of their corporate locations, so they took 200 corporate stores and refranchised them. I was working at head office. There were about 180 of us at head office. They were going to downsize it to 60. I was in the wrong 120. Mm -hmm. uh, so they came to those of us in the wrong 120 and said, well, instead of severance, would you like to give us money and you can buy a location? Uh, so we did. I went home to the bank of my mother and uh, she lent me, lent me the money and we bought a little a and in New Westminster and Royal City Center on the corner of 6th and 6th. There were six of us. Uh, we did $341,000 that first year and I learned I really hate wearing polyester all day long. Uh, so I knew I had to grow that business if I wanted to stay in it. Uh, so we grew that over time. The Mr. Mike's business came along in 2005. Uh, if you're a long-standing BC resident, you'll remember Mr. Mike's, you know, stinky salad bar. You got a wobbly tray. You got a really tough steak. You went along the line. They took the kale off the salad bar at the end of the day, rinsed it off, put it back the next day. That was the business model. Uh, we bought that uh, and rebranded it and repositioned it. Uh, so it was down to three locations when we bought it. We turned it into casual dining. So I would call it a downscale keg or an upscale Boston pizza. Uh, our internal name for it was Boston Steak, which sort of gives you a sense of where the positioning was. Um, we grew it back to 21 locations. I sold half of it to private equity in 2009, the other half to private equity in 2010, uh, and it continues to grow after that. Uh, so that's my connection. As a consultant, I've worked with a whole bunch of different brands. Uh, I worked for HMS Host, which is the largest Starbucks licensee on the planet. Uh, they're the largest Burger King licensee on the planet. They had a whole bunch of these other brands as well. So I've sat on both the franchisee side of the table for 20 years. I've been a franchisor along the way. I've worked on behalf of franchisors. So that got me here, I guess, today. So let's go. Uh, in thinking about whether your business is franchisable, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. Just nod or shake your head. You don't have to raise hands or anything. But do you say to others, say to yourself, or do you believe any of the following? I believe that I'm critical to the success of my business, or that if I'm not there, it's not going to happen. If I'm not in front of customers, customers don't see it the same way. If I'm not in front of clients, if I don't have the relationship with clients, uh, I won't be as successful. Uh, my customers come to see me. My clients like to interact with me. My clients like to deal with me. Uh, suppliers like to deal with me. If it wasn't for me, I wouldn't have all of the relationships I have. They wouldn't be as profound as they are. Anybody It's sounding familiar? Yeah, OK. Uh, remember, we're going at light speed here, so we need to nod quickly, shake quickly. Uh, it's the little things or the intangible things that I do in my business that make it successful. It's those things I can't quite point out. It's the things I can't quite tell you, but I know I do them. It's those little things that make the difference, the things around the edge, uh, things that don't really, you know, I can't explain, but I know I do them. It's that je ne sais quoi, that kind of thing. Any of those ring true? Uh, my competitors can't do what I do. I bring a certain something, I bring a certain life, I bring a certain spirit, uh, you know, I know things that others don't know, any of that. And other people don't get my vision. I have this great vision and I really, you know, other people just don't see it the way I see it. Do you ever say that? I, you know, I see further into the future than everybody else sees. I see a vision for this business that other people can't see. So I'd say if any of those are true for you, it is really hard to replicate that. So in terms of franchising being a model, if any of those five things are true, it is really hard to document the intangible. It's really hard to replicate you. I know McDonald's did it. They took Ronald and put a statue of him in every store. <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. It's very difficult if any of these things really relate to you. So moving ahead, to be a franchise, a business must have a system. And I pause on the word system. Because a system is something that encompasses all of the things that you do in a business. All of them, from soup to nuts, beginning to end, every interaction with a supplier, a customer, the way you look, the way you smell, the way you appear, the way customers perceive your brand, all of those things need to be easily documented. And by easily documented, I mean that somebody who reads that document can, do, can replicate the system for you. Not somebody who reads the document and attends a nine-month training course or goes to 
you know, Cambodia and sits by a certain tree in order to get the message. <laughs> they, they actually have to be able to read that document and then go away and do it. So, and it's got to be simple to execute. People who are buying franchises want to do, they don't want to think. Mm -hmm. So they come to get something that they can easily execute. And remember, they don't have your vision, they don't have the passion that you have for it. So they need to have something that's easily implementable and easily executable. You must have a value as the franchisor that you're going to deliver that outweighs the fee that you will collect. So I'd pause on that to say in whatever product or service it is that you have, that's your thesis today, right? So you say that I give my customers more value, whatever that means, a better product, better service, I give them more value than they pay me for. Because if you don't, it's, pretty, it's not a sustainable business, right? So if customers don't get as much value as they're giving me in cash, they're not going to come back. Is that a reasonable thesis? Same in franchising. If your franchisees do not get more value than the money they are giving you, they should just do it themselves. A good idea simply isn't enough. People don't pay for good ideas. What people do is mercilessly plagiarize them. So if what you have is a really good idea, people will mercilessly rip it off, replicate it, change the name very slightly, and change the look very slightly, and do it themselves. Right? What you have to have is the system behind it that's translatable. Have a clear and easily explained strategy, value proposition, market positioning, and customer segmentation. Back to again, you have to have something to sell. And what you sell is, I know something about operating this business and the customers who come for this business and how we connect with them. I know something about that that you do not know. And that's what I'm going to sell you. That's what you're going to pay me for. And last, but probably most importantly, you must be sufficiently profitable to pay both the franchisor. So this is your franchisee. has to be sufficiently profitable to pay you and to reward them for both risk, so they're taking a risk, signing up with you, they're going to make a capital investment, and they're going to put their time into it. So they need to pay themselves, and they also need to pay you. So in looking at the margins in your business, there has got to be enough money at the bottom line to hit all of those things. And if there's not, again, why would, what, what do they need you for exactly? So a franchise is simply this. And the, Profound words are in yellow. Uh, a system where the franchisor, so system key, franchisor, delivers value. So it delivers value not just once, delivers value over and over and over again on a sustainable basis that is at least equivalent to the fee the franchisees pay. Does that make sense? An interesting transition as you move from being an operator to a franchisor. So in your business today, your customers are your customers. As a franchise, your franchisees are your customers. So when we were started with Mr. Mike's, we had three corporate locations. So our customers were the people who came in and bought stakes. As we became a franchisor, we went from having, at, at our high point, we had about 7 million customers a year. We went from 7 million customers a year to 21. It had 21 restaurants owned by 21 different people. Those were the people I dealt with. Those were the people our organization, as a head office organization, were designed to support. We were not designed to directly support customers. We were designed to create systems that support customers, but the customers now belong to the franchisee. It's the franchisee that has that relationship with the customers. It's the franchisee that will connect with them. And it's, if it's going to happen, it's the franchisee that's going to piss them off. So to be ha this is a little bit tongue in cheek, but work with me. To be happy as a franchisor, you must be able to Happily watch others do a poor job executing the business that you founded, own, believe in, are passionate about, love, tell your family about at night, pat yourself on the back for developing. You must enjoy being told why you need to change your vision, product, services, pricing, target, basically everything in your business. Mm -hmm. Somebody is sending you a fee, they are going to want to tell you exactly what you should be doing. And you're married to your idea, and they're married to not liking your idea. And because they send you a fee, they think it entitles them to tell you all of that over and over and over again. And I would tell you, having been a franchisee my whole life, I say this a bit tongue in cheek, but if you're a real entrepreneur, and I use that term loosely, but if you're a real entrepreneur, you put your own name on the door and you start your own business or you buy a business. If you're 99% of an entrepreneur, maybe you find a franchise. 
So you're still taking risk, right? You're still putting capital at risk, you're putting your time at risk, you're putting your reputation at risk, you're getting out there, you're standing in front of customers, you risk failure, you risk bankruptcy, you put your house on the line. So you're all bad as an entrepreneur, but you don't have to come up with the idea. You don't have to come up with the strategy. You don't have to put your name on it. You buy into somebody else's system. So what I'd tell you is, as a 99% entrepreneur, franchisees often know what you shouldn't be doing. They're not always able to substitute what you should be doing. And you have to be okay with that. You have to enjoy working with people who don't share your vision and just don't care as much as you do. So why would you do it? Uh, basic reason, you can expand with little or no capital. So the normal inhibitor to growth is either capital or human resources. Franchisees supply both. Believing that owners care more than paid managers. And I would say in my, in 20 years in franchising, the worst owners are worse than the best managers, and the best owners are better than the best managers. Does that make sense? So a crappy franchisee, I would take a great employee any day, and because you can fire a crappy employee, good luck firing a crappy franchisee, but a great owner does care and does deliver more than a great employee. Royalty sure are nice. <laughs> There's an association called the Canadian Franchise Association, which makes sense. And somebody once nicknamed it the Canadian Open the Envelope and Cash the Check Association. <laughs> uh, rebate streams sure are nice as well. Uh, and done well, it allows you to focus on the fun stuff. So for most people, the strategic stuff, product development, marketing plans, customer segmentation, dealing with you know, the strategic level stuff, that's the fun stuff. And the nitty gritty of having to get up every morning and deal with staff and customers all day long tends to be the less fun stuff. And in franchising, if you're purely a franchise organization, you get to deal with all that fun stuff and somebody pays you to deal with all that crappy stuff that you really don't want to do all day long. So well done. That can be a really neat experience and incredibly rewarding. Okay, so to wrap up, I've got a top 10 list. I think it's really funny myself, but you know, laugh, don't laugh, as you see fit, it is the end of the day. So this is written from a franchisee perspective. So it's the top 10 reasons that the franchise or franchisee relationship is like a marriage. Number one, it lasts for 10 years, sometimes 20. Average Canadian marriage is only 7.2, so it actually exceeds that. Uh, it costs you money to consummate, yeah. Uh, you're now obligated to do exactly what you're told as a franchisee, yeah? yeah. Uh, they send people to make sure you're doing what you're told. Uh, you lose your individual identity. Yeah. Uh, you change your name and take on theirs. Yeah. Uh, you argue with the other party quite regularly. Very true. Uh, you always lose. <laughs> Welcome to Canadian franchise law. Canada has the toughest franchise laws in the Western world. Uh, Alberta, PEI and Ontario are, are at the peak of that. Uh, a franchisor has not won a piece of in-court litigation in the province of Alberta in a decade. So the, the way the courts in Canada view franchising is big mean franchisor who knows a lot, small little franchisee from small town somewhere in Canada who's put their house on the line to do this business, big mean franchisor failed to tell little franchisee something important, and so little franchisee should be let off the hook. Like that, that is the Canadian interpretation of franchising law. So you always lose. Uh, after a while, you start to look for new relationships. <laughs> and if you want out, you lose your show. <laughs> so that's my 45 minutes in 17 minutes. Questions? I have a question. Thank actually. goodness, because that was getting awkward. Um, I actually franchised my business a year ago, and I actually now think it's not the right model. And I don't know how to get out of it. It's rough. I, you, honestly, the, e the easiest way out is to get the checkbook out and buy them out. Yeah. Uh, you, I mean, there you can go and start enforcement proceed. You know, start documenting and yeah, we, documenting lack of compliance. And you know, the, the real recourse is to make it so awkward for the franchisee that they voluntarily hand you your logo back and just keep doing a, a not dissimilar business on their own. Right. Do you know what I mean? They'll keep. They, they change the names, they change the logos, they change the book, they paint the wall, they t you know, but they kind of go on a little bit doing whatever it is they're doing, what they use a system. What's happened is they're in love with the idea of what we do, but they don't know how to run a business. And as much as we try to help them, you know, you 
you've got to get your Facebook page up, you've got to get out. Soon, you know, as soon as they decide, we're like, right, here's your marketing materials, get out there, start doing this. But they're like, oh, wait, I can't, I've, I've got to get a babysitter, I've got to do it. And so I feel like they don't have maybe the aptitude, even though they're very passionate about what we do. Yeah, I, you know, the tough part of franchising is once you have granted somebody the franchise, it's yeah. almost irrevocable in right. its lifetime. So the, the real key is to pick the right people, yeah, that's obviously, kind of the, the first time. I'm now. And French, especially new franchisors, we all get married to the idea of fees. Right? So a new franchisee pays you a fee. That's really exciting. right? It's right. a check for not doing all that much. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. And you know there's a royalty stream coming for, again, not necessarily. Doing, so we get married to signing up people, and we convince ourselves that they're the right people because yeah. they're passionate. And you know, in the restaurant industry, everybody knows how to eat. So they think they can run restaurants, right? It's, direct, it's a direct connection. I know how to eat. I enjoy eating out. Therefore, I'll be a great restaurateur. Right. Uh, but then you've got employees and you know, late shifts, and you've got to get up in the morning and work till 1 in the morning. And then people lose interest at that. So it's really that. How do you screen people? And how do you make yeah. sure that they're committed to running your system right? and not committed necessarily? So you know, we all look for entrepreneurs and say it's that entrepreneurial spirit we're looking for. It's actually not always. Right? Sometimes it's. You know what, I really want to follow a system. I want you to come and help me be successful. But once you have them, it's a usually a, yeah. it's either years it. or a checkbook. And I, you know, it just amazes me. Why would you buy? Why would you give somebody money and then do that? It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's that, I, for me, it's that 99% entrepreneur, right? I, I'm enough of an entrepreneur to want to do it. And then I think that I know better than you do. And I'm going to tell you how it is that you're going to run your business. And I've sat in rooms full of franchisees who uh, you know, if you if you acceded to every franchisee and what they wanted to do, you'd be running 700 different organizations in the one organization. Like everybody has a different view, and if you run a A&W in Vancouver or an A&W in Northern Saskatchewan, you, your customers are different. So you know, your customers in Northern Saskatchewan come in and say, you know what, it's really important we have soup, right? We really need soup in the A&W. The A&W is the only restaurant in my little town. All my customers come in; they're passionate about soup. So from the franchisee's point of view, you know what, it makes sense to put soup on the menu. You can't do it, but you have to be, you know, as a franchisee, you have to be able to acknowledge this is would be good for me. It would not be good for everybody, so I will suffer in order that the system prospers. Very few people can, <laughs> can willingly do that, right, and say, I will suffer for the benefit of the system. How do you buy them back then, Yuri? Like, what, how would you yeah. approach someone to be like, okay, like, besides writing a check, is there a strategy around that so they don't blow up in your face and... Yeah, you know, I mean, I would use a moment where they're pissed off at you and, you know, not uh, get some distance from that minute and say, you know, it doesn't feel like yeah. this system is, does make sense for you. Like, what what if you took the position of, you know what, you're, you're such a good entrepreneur, Mr. and Ms. Franchisee, you're so good at this, I don't think you need us anymore. So what if we released you? Right. And so, you know, we'll, we'll want our logos back or whatever it is that's proprietary yeah. to you. Yeah. We're going to want that stuff back. but. You know, I think you're beyond us now. You don't need us. All these other franchises, they really need our system. Mm -hmm. But you, like, I think you're miles ahead. <laughs> why, don't, why don't we release each other? <laughs> you might have to warm up to that. But if you could allow them to, to choose to leave. Right, but do I have to pay them to leave? Not if they choose to leave. I mean, you could release them. If, if they willingly said, I will go and give you your logos back, you know, or whatever's proprietary. To the franchisee who's paid her these fee um, to just... Do you have an ongoing fee? Royalty. Or is that a one time? Yeah, so they'd get, away, they'd get out of the royalty. Right. Okay. So they may take the position, and, and uh, don't, sorry, I don't know your business well, but they may take the position, you know what, I actually don't need you anymore. I can go and deliver very similar to what it is they're doing today or all identical, and I can deliver it without your banner. Um, but yeah, it just, I don't know, I just feel like I've, when you've got ones where it works, and I know the system works, but then the ratio seems I've got more that it's not working for. I don't think that's uncommon for new franchisors. Okay. I think the, the first, I mean, I'm going to make up a number, but the first 25, it, it's really tough. Like the, I'm scared to go anymore. <laughs> <laughs> How do you sort of make that decision between the two models? Well, Felicia will talk a bit about licensing and the comparison. I, I think it comes down to the amount, in summary, and I don't want to preempt what I know is on Felicia's slides, but I think it comes down to the amount of control that you need to have in order for the brand and business to be successful. Okay, so I know I'm standing between you and the end of the day. 
<laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Okay, so um, yeah, so URI has covered a lot, and, and there are a lot of similarities between franchising and licensing, but there are also huge differences between them. And so, um, so he's covered, you know, what franchising is, and I'll talk about uh, how, you know, how it's different, and also how, you know, exactly. So, Carla, that was a good segue. Um, how do you know whether which one to pick, and whether it even is an option for you? And so, um, so licensing is really you know, something of value that you make available to another party. Can you guys see this okay? Yeah, something of value that one party makes available to another party. And actually, it is all around us. Um, and so this is a sample of, um, and so my background is that I've been a, a, licensor, a licensee, and I'm still a licensee today. So um, my experience is through a, a coaching company called Go CEO, And it's a licensed coaching company. And so there's about uh, 300, and, um, 300 or, or so business coaches around the world. And uh, so I'm a licensee of that company, fell in love with licensing. And so when Yuri talked about uh, the 99% entrepreneur, it gave me a really good way to jump into the business world coming from a corporate background and not needing to know, you know everything and also not wanting to make mistakes. So I think that it's, uh, it's a fantastic way uh, for people that want to get into businesses, but maybe you know don't want to, because how you know how long has have you taken uh, of how many years and how many uh, how much blood, sweat, and tears has it taken you to create what you created? And so then what you're doing is really leveraging and making that available to someone uh, to learn from what you've done, and that they have a proven model that they can go from without you know needing to invest all that years and time. And in exchange for that, they pay you a fee, and so either through franchising or through licensing fees, and so. Um, so something, uh, and so currently I also ha have a, I'm a licensor as well, and so I have about six uh, licensees that are under one of my models. And so in total, and then I am also a, have sub-license. So I've seen a lot of various models of licensing, um, have, have perfect licensees today, have the worst licensees today in my current model. I'm actually in court right now with one of my licensees. And so, um, and so I'm not worried about it because um, BC happens to be one of the places that are, uh, is really pro-licensor. And so in all the cases that we've gone, um, and even in, in GoCO itself, you know, a number of times we've had to go to court with a licensee that doesn't work out. And 100% of the time, it's been favorable to the licensor. And so then, um, yeah, so licensing is actually a process that kind of works well, and BC is um, a, a, you know, a haven kind of for licensing. And so you've seen it everywhere. You know, when you buy a copy of uh, uh, you know, Microsoft Word, you're not buying Microsoft Word. You're buying a license to use Microsoft Word. And so we see it used by you know, companies like Liz Disney to license products. And I know that you know, some of you have art that you're licensed. And so you're making it available to someone else to use. And so in terms of what we're going to talk about today, though, it's more about uh, licensing your business model. And, and so, you know, and maybe you have a product or a program or a strategy, as Carla mentioned, that, you know, this is a specific way that you've done something and that works very well and it's proven. And so how can you get somebody else to, you know, pay you to use that? And so I would say that the um, difference between licensing and franchising, as Yuri mentioned, uh, it comes down to the span of control that you're looking for. And so you'll see that um, uh, in franchises, usually there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of requirements in terms of thou must do this. You know, you must open at this hour. You have to use this sort of materials. You have to um, offer this type of menu in a restaurant. Whereas in licensing, there's a lot of flexibility for the licensee to actually decide what they want to do. And so and often, they actually operate under their own name. And so you'll see that, you know, for example, I'm a, uh, a coach under a, li you know, a license program called GoCEO, but I operate under Candio Business Coaching. And so, uh, and, so, and so licensing that makes it very flexible for the licensees. And so if they're an entrepreneur that they have their own ideas of what brand they want to build, uh, what they're actually licensing is the methodology and the, uh, you know, and the proprietary processes, if you will, to do something. But then they take on all the risk, right? Like they, they you know, you don't have to worry about your brand getting mucked up by somebody that isn't gonna, you know, do justice. And so as long as, as you know, an example I would use is it's a little bit like, um, uh, like being a landlord, you know. And so you have this this place that you're renting it out for somebody to use. As long as they pay the rent. And as long as they don't um, trash your place, you're pretty good with whatever else that they do, right? They have a lot of flexibility. You're not going to tell them that 
you know, when you're, when you're leasing uh, some, a space to someone, you don't care if they open at 10 a.m. or they open at 7 a.m. It's up to them. But, but if the, moment, the day that they don't pay your rent, you go, okay. Now, now I have a problem, right? Or they, they trash your place or something like that. And so um, a couple of other differences, you'll see that, yeah, the hours and operations and usually are re pretty heavily regulated by the franchisor. But in the, in the licensing system, uh, usually the, the license, uh, licensees can decide how frequent or how often or how they want to use the material. It's really up to them. Uh, and then uh, usually, you know, again in the franchising, um, the the franchisor usually has approved vendors that the uh, you know the, the franchisees have to buy from. But in a licensing system, a licensor does not actually control the capital asset. So you might offer them suggestions of, hey, you know, here are some some places that you might want to get your equipment from. But again, they don't they don't have to, right? And if you want them to use a certain type of thing, you probably need to include that as part of the licensing. So it's got to be offered to them um, for, you know, as part of the licensing fee. And um, the, you know, there's a usual, and another difference is that usually with franchisee, there's um, an engagement fee up front. But in licensing, the orders of the fees, I would say that it's usually on the lower end of what, um, you know, of what a franchise, compared to a franchise. And so whereas franchises would, you know, maybe uh, typically start anywhere from, Twenty thousand dollars, or you know, or higher, and goes up to right like uh, hundreds of thousand dollars and even million dollars. Uh, in in licensing, usually it's a it's a lower fee, and uh, and also there's usually isn't a lot of um, capital investment that needs to be made into it to get it to work. And so those are some of the um, differences. Okay, so how do you know if your business is licensable? Uh, again, you know, if it needs to be proven, so nobody's gonna pay you a fee for something that hasn't worked. And so when you mentioned that, I've got a great idea, can I license it? Probably not yet. Uh, you probably want to wait until that it's something that's been proven and uh, profitable. Again, something that's not dependent on you. We usually recommend that you know, it's successfully been operated for about 12 to 18 months before you consider it. Because your licensee is going to ask you a question of, well, like, was it luck that you got it to work? And, um, and, uh, and in fact, most of our licensees come when they've had probably about three or four different uh, people operating at different locations, et cetera, before they consider licensing, because then we really consider it to be a proven model, and not just because you were unique and you were special and you could get it to work, but nobody else could. Um, and so again, question, can you kill the baby? Uh, and so uh, it seems very violent, but, um, <laughs> but what we really mean by that is that, you know, are you ready for someone else to run, you know, to use your system and to run it, uh, you know, under their with their own way and also under their own brand. And so sometimes I find that that is a, uh, you know, it, it's sort of a, a mental shift that someone has to make that you are ready to be a queen or a king maker. That you don't have to be the queen or king that's, you know, that owns the brand that controls what it looks like. But you're ready to leverage your. Uh, you know your intellectual property and support someone else to build something that they want to build and that you get paid a fee in exchange for that. Um, yeah, so those are some of the key points. I'll give you these slides as well. Uh, and so should I consider licensing? A couple of questions to ask. Can you let others run what you have built? Can you put in hard work in the beginning? And so when we talk about systems, there's quite a bit of documentation usually uh, you know, required in the beginning about how do you, how do you market? How do you operate what you do? How do you service your customers? What if you have um, ABC customers and what if this happens? Uh, the, more, the better the system is, the, the fewer phone calls you're going to get from your licensee. So when you have 300 to 1,000 licensees, you don't want them to phone you. And you want your, your systems to be fairly well you know, documented and fairly self-explanatory. Um, yeah, so your role really changes from somebody that operates the business to somebody that's building systems for someone else to leverage. And so you'll find that um, uh, the, you know, your day-to-day your -day work will change from somebody that's doing the work to somebody that's actually managing uh, licensees and learning how to be a, a licensor. Okay, so there are some common mistakes, and I think a, a really big one is, uh, is really not understanding the difference between franchise and license. Uh, you know, today we haven't talked about the legal differences, but there's quite uh, a substantial you know, different process in terms of making sure that if you're a franchise, you have to be registered under 
you know, different provinces. You have to have a separate agreement in each province. And li in licensing, it, it's you know, different that way, that you don't have those requirements. Um, but again, a lot of people uh, sometimes call something a license, but then they actually run it like a franchise, which is a, a dangerous thing to do. And um, yeah, I'll send these to you. And so I would say that the, um, uh, there's four stages of licensing, but I, I put it on here slide so that you can get it, but we, we won't have time to go into it. Uh, but it doesn't take that long to actually build a license. It typically takes anywhere from maybe three, three, you know, we usually when we do it, it takes about three, anywhere from three to six months to kind of complete it. And the challenge is that when you're moving from a, you know, owner operated model to a licensing model is that you have to run your business while you are creating the license. And so it's usually the three to six months is because uh, we're still trying to, you know, drive the boat while, while we are creating this other model to run. And so that's why it's not, not a full time thing. And yeah, so the, the key is really you want to bring in uh, the right legal counsel at the end once you figure out what you want to license and you want to have you know, your licensing agreements and the NDA structured and uh, have a, a good structure to building the, the tools for that. Uh, and so, you know, I was, Yuri was mentioning that um, uh, franchising is a lot like have a marriage and licensing is very much like raising children. <laughs> and so with licensing, uh, your licensees in the beginning are like babies. So they depend on you for everything. You have to teach them, you have to educate them. But after a while, your goal in the licensing arrangement is to get them to be independent. Uh, that you know you, you want to feed them in the beginning, but you don't want them to still in their fifth year of licensing to be calling you and asking you a lot of questions. And so that's really the difference. And I find that um, in my experience with licensees that um, uh, that they, they go through all the stages that children go through. You know, they go through the beginning stages, they become a toddler, they become more independent, and then they go through these teenage years of being really awful. Uh, like, you know, they have their own mind, and then they think that the licensor doesn't know anything, and, you know, we just do it so much better. And so if they come through that stage, they come out on the other side and become adult licensees that are actually quite positive. <laughs> you know, and so the relationship is that, um, yeah, the relationship is that they actually have, um, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of independent, right, from them, but they come to you for counsel, and they're running their own business, they're using your systems, uh, but again, you are, you know, it's not the same family. Uh, they have their own thing. So that follows a good analogy uh, for what licensing when is. When do you kill them? When do you kill them? <laughs> yeah. And so again, when it comes to licensing, uh, I mean, we, we do quite a lot of work with our clients in terms of helping them identify, like, how do you know who's a good license, who would make a good licensee and who would make a bad licensee? And so, yeah, we have actually, even on, um, I have a list of questions that I, I typically get my clients to ask. And usually if they say things like, oh, um, I want to, you know, how fast can I make money at this? Or, uh, oh, and, um, you know, can I, I like to do my own things and I don't like to follow what you say. I, I tend to be the person that wants to create things on my own. You know, you'd be surprised that people actually will say that when they're buying a license. You're like, okay, then you're probably not very, going to be very good at following the system. And so, you know, again, like anything else with this, there's, a, there's more flexibility in terms of what licensees can do, but they do have to master um, how to use the license before they get to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's it for me. Any questions? Yeah, so what happens is the, the licensor will probably give you the name to use, but then in, in effect, the, the contract that you might have with a client is no longer going to be with that company. It's going to be with the licensee's company. So for example, um, you know, like let's say that you, company A uh, decides to open a new location and then maybe the operator there, they decide to buy a license from them. So their customers originally would pay company A maybe because, because that's a relationship. But when they change it to a licensor arrangement, then now the, you know, now the customer will actually pay the licensee's company. Yeah, so. What types of companies are, would you say are best suited for this model? Um, there's actually quite, I mean, there's still quite a lot, but in terms of what we're doing, uh, we primarily work with service-based companies uh, to help them package together their, uh, yeah, their processes or their products or their intellectual, you know, like in, in terms of how they deliver a service. And then um, it works well for people that want to expand, but maybe don't want to bring on employees or you, you, you're looking really for people that are, uh, more like business owners, that they would be responsible for their own business development. And so usually in our um, licensing work, 
we package together all the business development component and really teach our licensees how to, how to make their own business work. And so that you're more teaching of a skill set rather than you know, doing, doing the work for them. Yeah. If you don't get a franchise or a license route, right. what other options are there to buy? Corporate, um, yeah, you own corporate growth. And so you, know, you can always get external funding. And you know, there's a lot of, yeah, just tradi your traditional corporate way of growing. I think it depends on, um, I always say that you want to, you know, growth, business growth is like a custom suit, right? You, you don't not need to follow what other people do, but you have to be clear about what fits you. And because your lifestyle as a franchisor or as a licensor, or as somebody that owns, you know, grows by through corporate growth is very different.